Bases dropped on Soccer's morning show. It's another round of soccer down here. It's Thursday, therefore. Ergo, it is Thursday thoughts. John here, Jarrett there. And uh, once again, you know, for those of you who are watching live on Twitch, you'll see that, yes, I do have multiple computers and TVs up because uh, uh, full disclosure, full disclosure this morning, it, it is my 10th wedding anniversary. And so we have a to do. Or is it, Jared, is it officially a to-do or a shindig? How would you classify it? I think either one's acceptable in this scenario. Okay. I think so, anyway. Okay. Oh, yeah, we have a to-do slash shindig tonight. I'm kind of keeping an eye on what's happening right now, and uh, are we going to have to batten down hatches in the tent this evening for uh, the the celebrations and things like that? So, yes, off to my left, you will see uh, weather and things like that so there's a there's a reason behind it at least today uh thursday thoughts so whatever's on your mind there's a lot to talk about today uh the the ongoing uh, discussions involving joseph martinez atlanta united picked up another goalkeeper yesterday we'll get into that uh, we've got other moves in and around major league soccer there's some news about mls outside of the meetings in uh, san jose about concussion subs henry bushnell had an article about it at Yahoo yesterday. Uh, so uh, Ola Kamara, uh, there's uh, drama involving, or sorry, uh, uh, Kai, Kamara, is Kai Kamara or Ola Kamara? I get my Kamaras confused. Kai. Kai, thank you. Okay, so uh, Kai Kamara, there's allegedly apparently drama uh, involving his tenure in Montreal, so we'll get into that too. And, Montreal's uh, having a bad week. Yes, they are. So, uh, And there's also talk that somebody who played in the 22 World Cup might actually uh, – play in the 26 World Cup. These folks are confident in that they're putting words in this gentleman's ability who's in his mid-30s, and they're confident that he can go for one more round. So uh, opening kickoff, brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com. Uh, good question, Parzival, about the login. I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Um, so when folks know and perhaps it's something that can be put in the, uh, the Twitch pitch slash Discord when you get your login info, let us know. I mean, it might be it might be fe- in probably February, a couple weeks before the kickoff of the season, something like that. So that would be, that'd be my number one guess. But uh, opening kickoff brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee, kickoffcoffeeco.com. And uh, there's your QR code for those of you watching on Twitch. Uh, kickoff Coffee CO, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Don't forget to use the code Soccer down here fifteen. When it comes to your purchases at Kickoff Coffee, then they in turn give you 15% off and take 10% reinvested into the youth game and youth initiatives. Very, very cool stuff from our friends at Kickoff Coffee and kickoffcoffeeco.com. Uh, opening kickoff this morning. Uh, and uh, Jared, I was, I was, you know, when this particular story came across, I figured that it was prime opening kickoff material because uh, a lot of folks were scratching their heads when uh, PK uh, decided to, you know, uh, not have a, a nice relationship with his uh, long time. Now, were they married or were they just, were they just. Uh, uh, I think they were married. I don't, I don't know. I don't, I don't, I, I don't care about this as much as apparently everyone else does. <laughs> Shakira wrote a diss track. She did. No that's, question. That's pretty much it. Like, yes. I, I haven't kept up or been as invested in it as everyone else is. So. Oh no, I haven't either. But I just I just thought that you know first and foremost when, when somebody writes a diss track, uh, here's how our friends at Billboard uh, phrased this: Shakira did not hold back on her first single of the year, uh, BZRP Music Session Number Fifty Three. But apparently, you're supposed to refer to that as Bizrap Music Session Fifty Three. Uh, Bizarap, sorry, helmed by the Argentine hitmaker Bizarap. So it's Bizarap Music Session 53, a nearly four minute dance pop track. The Colombian artist is more unapologetic and empowered than ever, spitting diss verses to her ex boyfriend and soccer star Gerard Piquet. Oh, maybe and, they weren't married. And even, throw, and even throwing a jab at his new girlfriend, Clara Chia Marti. Quote I'm not getting back with you. Don't cry for me nor beg me. Next line. I understood that it's not my fault that they criticize you. Next line. I only make music. Sorry that it bothers you. Also saying in the lyrics, you left me the in-laws as my neighbors, media outlets at my door, and in debt with the government. You thought you hurt me, but you made me stronger. 
Women don't cry anymore. They cash in. And here's the, uh, apparently Bizarap, uh, like wears a, a helmet or some kind of night goggles over his face when it comes to promo photos. Uh, sorry, I got on another plane. I'm not coming back here. I don't want another disappointment. You go around saying you're a champion, and when I needed you, you gave your worst version. Uh, a she-wolf like me is not for rookies. A she-wolf like me is not for guys like you. I'm too good for you, and that's why you're with someone just like you. So there's your shot at the new girlfriend. So, yes, apparently Shakira Bizarap Music Sessions 53 is on the YouTubes. And, uh, yeah, so Shakira, uh, she's still, uh, you know, when you when you say you're past somebody, then all of a sudden you can sit there and write a music track. And uh, all of a sudden it all comes back flooding. So. Uh, for those of you that wish to uh, check out Bizarap session number 53 with Shakira, uh, those of us, uh, probably the majority of us on the planet, are still wondering why Gerard Piquet decided not to continue with Shakira in the first place. When in doubt, don't get mad. Get W's. Write a diss track. That's what she did. Write a she diss track. Because, yeah, also, <laughs> I'm pretty sure she came out of that uh, Spanish tax situation in pretty decent shape, actually. Like, wasn't. No, um, yes, she did. That's right. Like, that she went pretty did. well for her, yeah. all things considered. Yeah, if I remember that correctly, yeah. She she got, she uh, she and the Spanish tax man uh, came out on good terms and a handshake, and, and all of the paparazzi outside the building were taking photos, and Shakira was smiling. I do remember that. Um, let's yeah. see. So, Nix is asking when the SDH version of this song is dropping, and, he need, and Nix needs auto-tune on what I just did. No offense, to, no. no offense to me, none taken Nick's as ever. No, this that's, uh, yeah. So so that's not see. happening. No, but I'm trying to think of who is it that, uh, oh man, who is it that uh, that's going to come to me at like three thirty in the morning? Uh, Please don't message me when it happens. No, 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 no. It's it's like somebody who does that that auto tune stuff. Uh, they're, they're known for their. Think? Uh, not T-Pain. It's it's like an actual. It's like a group that is known for auto tune and uh, they auto tuned Mike Emrick once. Somebody auto tuned him to their their kind of music, but I'll, I'll remember it. I'm sure. For some reason, as you said that in my head, what 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 came out of my skull was the was the words Doc Emrick. Yeah, which and, is somehow even funnier. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> Someone auto tuning Doc Emrick would be better. Yeah, well, and and it was. Uh, uh, gosh, who was it? Um, oh man, I can't remember, and it's bugging me. Uh, oh, it's bugging me now that I can't. Uh, I can't figure out who that is. That's gonna bug me all morning now. Uh, not. Uh, it's not Technologic. It's somebody like Technologic, but it's not them, and I can't remember who it is. Uh, not the Gregory Brothers, Nick's. You're on the right path, but. Um, uh, they're the ones that wear the funky helmets. The 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 they, oh, they, uh, uh, oh um Daft like, Punk. Yes, Daft Punk. Daft Punk. Somebody did a Daft Punk Doc Emmerich remix. And that was oh it was tremendous. Yeah, so somebody did a Daft Punk version of Doc Emmerich Verbs, and it was amazing. But yeah, so uh close. Yeah, Devo I, yeah, that's flower pots. Uh, flower pots on the head, but no Daft Punk. So you you would be looking for a Daft Punk version of what I just read for SDH as the as the diss track. So yeah, I mean, if you want to put together some beats for the remix, that's what we got into this morning. It is Daft Punk, and uh, and both of us. Yeah, I'm I'm roping you into this, Jared. Reading uh, oh, Sha- reading Shakira lyrics from Bizarrap Fifty Three. I'm still trying to figure out PK. What were you thinking, man? Dead Mouse Five, yeah. Uh, I'm just still figuring out what PK was thinking. He was uh, no, exactly. Uh, and uh, that that's dude. That's one of the largest mess ups in quite some time. Okay, so uh, Daft Punk, Shakira, and uh, Jared PK. Uh, Daft Punk and uh, all of that stuff. That's your opening kickoff. Brought to us by our friends at Kickoff Coffee. Kickoffcoffeeco.com. Kickoff Coffee CO Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. There's the QR code blocking my face. Uh, for those of you watching on Twitch, don't forget to use the code soccer down here 15 when it comes to everything in kickoff coffee. And then in turn, they take 10% reinvested into the youth game at kickoff coffee. CO 
Com. All right. So uh, Atlanta United yesterday, the the uh, the news continues in a bunch of different directions. So once again, as Jarrett says, trust your sources, follow your sources, check your sources out and go with those who have the the larger numbers of followers. We, we have our S tier sources here in the States and the information involving uh, a possible move of Joseph Martinez to uh, Inter Miami has gone in several different directions, depending on who you believe. Uh, it is either a two-year deal wanted by Joseph's camp, Inter Miami only wanting one year on the deal. Joseph apparently uh, was either shopping for homes already and is down there or is not. And uh, so that's, that's where we are right now with, uh, did I miss anything? Just, uh, literally it is Joseph's camp wants two, inner Miami only wants one and he's looking for homes or he's not, and he's down there or he's not. That's where we are, Jared, as of yesterday. Did I miss anything? No, that's where we're at right now. Um, okay. <clears throat> it sounds like no matter what, he is, uh, not going to be in Atlanta, but, now it stands to kind of wait and see where he lands. Um, yeah, in relation to what's going on with uh, and going on with Miami. Now you're just trying to see how how it goes for Miami to see if they're able to get him um, locked in how they want him. Right now, if it comes down to one or two years, I'm sure they'll find a way to bridge that gap. Maybe it's an option. Maybe it's like a vesting option. If I don't, I think I don't know if you can do that with MLS contracts, but. I mean, do you write at a contract where, hey, it's a one-year deal with an option that vests if, um, you know, if you play this much or you produce this much, then yeah, we'll push you into the second year. Yeah. So, um, but just have to wait and see. I mean, you're gonna get you're gonna get reports all over the place. It's fine. It yeah. is what it is. So. Camps are gonna say camps are going to put out there the information that they want to put out there to benefit their individual. So. Uh, so that's what you're staring at with Joseph Martinez. The yeah, other did y'all time- know that people on the internet lie sometimes. I what? I know, right? And that what? agents and that agents occasionally get a little sideways. Like, just a, I mean, why thought? So yeah, so there you go. Uh, apparently, uh, in, involving uh, Joseph, uh, Tom got clarification from Doug Robertson at the AJC club was not able to buy him down. That was his biggest question. So other than keeping him at the DP salary. It was really their only option they could have traded somewhere to. But what stinks is the non-thinking people will be all up in their feels about which uh, all the Yeah. So uh, so that's that's where we are with Joseph. The other thing yesterday with Atlanta United was the signing of Clement Diop. And uh, once again, Jared, you made the point uh, that uh, you're, you're picking up all of the keepers that have those those days in the, the where they are completely and totally uh, warlockish against Atlanta United. So it's like, OK. If uh, you can't beat him, then you sign him, right? Yeah, this is the uh, what uh, like this is what Atlanta did with Levon Hernandez, what the Braves did um, <laughs> for so long, because sometimes you just decide, you know, this guy's hurt us too long. Yeah, come here. <clears throat> yeah, you can't hurt me if you're on my team, which is actually a lie because if you ever watched Levon Hernandez pitch oh. for the Atlanta Braves, then oh. you know that he can still hurt you even if he is. Uh, not technically playing against you. Yes. He could, you. Um, yes. He could still not, he could still have that 65 mile an hour floater that people just try. <sighs> he did the same thing with, um, with uh, Bartolo Cologne for a hot Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, this is, you've picked up a third veteran keeper or a third veteran keeper, really. Um, and I've seen the questions about Garces and how this factors in with him and Reyes. I would assume those guys are going to be playing a lot of, uh, Next a pro. lot of minutes for the next pro side of things. Right. Um, that's my expectation. Um, we'll see if that expectation is realized fully, but I would expect them to be playing MLS next pro. Yeah. Um, and, and the thing, and the thing is with keepers as well as keepers age differently than, than standard players. So like, you know, Garces being 23, 24 years old. Yeah. You are getting into that area where you want him to start getting more minutes. Um, you want him to start getting ready for that first time. And I think, I think you have, a good situation in the sense that, look, Brad Guzan is near the end of his career, especially coming off of an Achilles injury. Um, he is closer to the end than he is the beginning, obviously. Mm-hmm. 
you have also brought in two veteran goalkeepers as well, who, if nothing else, can help provide some sort of leadership and education for these younger goalkeepers, because it's not just Garces. Uh, Vicente Reyes is a very talented teenage keeper yeah. um, who has been playing with Chile's youth national team, who had some very good performances, especially as the 2022 USL season went on. Again, um, if you go watch Reyes or Garces last year, uh, you see the shooting gallery upon which they played in. A lot of times with the twos, giving up two, three goals a game was not always a, wow, they had a bad game. No, they, there were some of those games where they gave up two or three goals and they, they kept it from being like six, six. goals. Yes. Um, because the way Atlanta wanted to play in an attacking manner, a lot of times left their back line stretched out against some of these teams that love to counter. And man, those, those kids got run sometimes. Um, but you've got a situation here, I think, that once Guzan is, a, is done, that, you know, it's, it's, it's very easy to slot Garces in if you think he can be that guy. I think he can. Um, they do, too, because they put him on a homegrown deal. And it's actually a very, it, 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 it sets itself up for a really nice situation in a year or two, whenever that comes, because you have him on a homegrown deal. You, at that point, won't be paying him the Brad Guzan salary. Um, which Guzan's salary, in case we forgot, um, because this did happen last year, uh, Guz pulled Chipper Jones on everybody. Um, by that, I mean Brad Guzan took, uh, took, uh, re- took a restructured contract to free up some money last year. Yep. So, uh, not sure what he is, not sure what his plan is. Maybe a year or two more. Um, I don't know if he's going to be a starter level guy in two or three years if he wants to hang on and, maybe go into coaching, maybe go into broadcast, maybe hang around and be a backup and be kind of like a player coach role. But um, I don't necessarily expect it to be, you know, Brad Guzan in two, three years, still starting games for this team. But yeah, you brought in some backup guys. Um, and now we'll see what else they bring in. Cause yeah, they, they freed up a lot of money mm-hmm. this year so far. And some of it, could be very interesting to see the way they spend it. And some of it could be now we're assuming that they're going to be filling that striker spot sooner rather than later, like by the end of the month. Yeah. But I wonder if some of it you kind of hang on to until the summer and see what comes free then. Well, yeah. And uh, to Niall's point as a part of wondering about Brad's future, you could really see Brad being a coach, but how much he likes to yell at people. <laughs> But but I mean to your point to your point. Brad is loud. Y'all. Yes, he is. Yes, he is. Brad is a very loud human being. Brad Brad Guzan's a nice guy. Yes. Um, if you ever get a chance to like just talk to him, super nice, super uh, super personable, very gregarious, mm-hmm. um, very uh, pretty sharp wit, mm-hmm. like very snarky and not in a mean way, but just like he'll 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 just mess with you. Um, mm-hmm. But uh, he's always been very candid about stuff with us, but. Um, also a very loud human being, <laughs> like when he's on the field, you know, it. you, you know, he's there. Um, and, and that's, you know, when, when, you know, when you have keepers who have different, uh, different, yeah. uh, ways of going about things, different, different demeanors, you know, it, sometimes it does take a little while to get adjusted to someone who's more authoritative versus someone who's not, but to, but to your point. Going into training camp, more is not necessarily a bad thing. And, you know, you don't know how folks are going to respond in training camp. You're, you're kind of you're betting on what you would like the individual to do. You have the, the pedigrees of you have the pedigrees of Brad Gazan and Quentin Westberg. And then you bring in Clement Jopp. And okay. I, I would I would much rather have more to choose from than less and try to find something, if that makes any sense when it comes to positions yeah. and position group. Yeah, and, and so in this actually, uh, the, the, uh, the Twitch pitch um, is getting into this. Uh, so how do you guys feel about this? And this is for anybody. Like, Feel free, you can add us. I don't really care. I have nothing else going on. Um, if you're listening to it later, feel free to add us about it. Yes. Uh, Rich, that includes you. Hope you're well. I mean, yes, I will keep <laughs> slandering Philadelphia as long as I want. I hope you are well, my friend. Um, but 
how do you guys feel about the idea of like, what if they decide to take to not to like the, the, that the striker they want isn't there right now and they wait, like, how does everyone feel about how do how, how are we feeling about that concept? Like, yeah. let's work through, or, you know, therapy words on it. Um, yeah. How does everyone feel about that concept? If you wait, if you don't just sign somebody now, just for the sake of signing, you know, splashing seven, eight million dollars on a striker. Okay, Nick. So, uh, uh, how do you feel if you don't get that splash signing uh, uh, of the striker? Although Nile does bring in the the, uh, the remembrance that Joseph wasn't a splash signing when he first came in. So, uh, correct. As we as we are working through as we're workshopping our feelings this morning, Nick, what's on your mind? Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna have a history lesson here really quick for everybody who. Uh, is... I thought you were saying Jason Nix, and I was like, wait, that's not Jason. That's not yeah. Jason's voice. Nah. Nick. Nah. Nick. Oh. Nick, sir. But uh, the history lesson here is for all of those who are just magically gifted at reinventing their own history. Which I, there's nothing wrong with it. Everyone does it, and it's and it's fine. But when, when the Chattanooga game happened. I had uh, my my boy Jackie Fresh, and we went to go, you know, they had the opportunity to go meet the Atlanta United players after the game. And everybody, like 95% of the group, rushed over to the left to meet Andrew Carlton. Rushed. I'm talking like dead sprinting across the stadium. Joseph was at the right side, and it was me... Jackie Fresh and maybe about 10 other people. And <clears throat> nobody knew who this guy was. No, nobody. They, they were like, oh, he comes from Torino. Okay, great. Like, it's not even like a big club in Italy. All right. Well, I think the biggest gonna... thing people here knew about Torino is we had the Winter Olympics there one year. Yeah. That's it. Yes. And so um, the, the definition of splash is, I, I think, very Eurocentric. I think it's more of, you know what do we de- what we define now as a splash in Atlanta in 2023 is going to be something very very different than what we would have considered a splash signing uh back in 2017 and so i don't care if we make a splash or not i would like to see someone uh who is pr- at least presented as uh not even an heir apparent but this is someone who's occupying this position just tell me that we have a, a, a warm body in the striker position and then let them cook. And when summer comes around and you're not dealing with the World Cup price spike, right? Because yeah. some of the players that we're talking about here are from countries that participate in the World Cup. And after every World Cup, there's a price spike. Mm-hmm. If we can get to the summer where those prices have sort of reached a, a normal, then, uh, you know, then that's fine. Then let's, then, then, that can shop, but I, I want the right solution over the popular solution. Give me the right solution because I've seen too many times in business and sports where the popular decision, the, 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 Ooh, ah, decision turns out to be crap. And then the right decision, uh, is, is the one that kind of goes under the radar and becomes the better long-term option. Now, one thing that uh, we have not had the opportunity to, to talk to you about, Nick, is you know, we got into the Joseph update uh, earlier in the show about uh, Inter Miami and that being the, the probable or the, the most talked about outlet for Joseph right now. I would maintain that if Inter Miami signs him, it's going to be in the Gonzalo Higuain 2023 role. Where we, you know, we saw what Gonzalo Higuain did in 22. That's what I'm anticipating. They would want Joseph to be in 23. Looks like Joseph's camp, from some reports, wants a two. Inter Miami wants a one. Joseph is either shopping for a house or he's not. What's uh, as you've been monitoring the Joseph Martinez situation? What's been going through your mind? I well, with <clears throat> with respect to this, I, I understand Joseph's and his camp's position. You want as much security for your client as you can possibly get. Two years, you know, that gives you time to settle in. The time it gives you time to adjust to the culture of the locker room, the the culture of uh, 
you know, the, of, that the manager tries to, to have in place. One year, there's, there's a, a lot of variables that go into that. You know, are you picking things up quickly, slowly? How does that play in if it doesn't quite go as smoothly as you want? And, you know, then you're looking for a, a third team, you know, within, uh, within a two-year period. And you, and you don't want that, right? Uh, so I have no problem with him trying to get the best option for, you know, f- for him where he did two year deal. The one year from Miami's perspective makes a ton of sense. House shopping, uh, you know, great. Uh, I, I, I think that, you know, it, 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 there's the doom and gloom. And I, I'm, I'm, I would say I'm not typically a sunshine pumper. I, I, I you know, uh, but this reminds me a lot of a couple of situations. One is when the 49ers were moving on from Joe Montana and there was a lot of strife within the fan base that, you know, Joe, Joe Montana is the legend. How dare we push him out? How dare we get rid of him? He's bought numerous Super Bowls. You're absolutely insane to do this. And there was a lot of animosity between Montana and the Niners organization at that time, but they had, you know, the difference is, is that they had Steve Young waiting in the wings, right? So you had a, a verifiable asset waiting to take over. Um, you know, in Green Bay, the, the, it, no matter, I think he's a trash human being, but when, when they were shoved Brett Favre out the door. Right. And, uh, you know, you had Aaron Rodgers uh, waiting in, in the wing, also a trash human being, but that's my own opinion, but whatever. <laughs> uh, it, it, and, but the thing is, is that it's inevitable that a legend is going to be shown the door. It, it's inevitable. And you either have something like the Niners and Green Bay, you know, where you're able to move the legend and still find success afterwards, or you do something like the Hawks where you send Dominique Wilkins out and bring in Danny Manning and yeah. it's still talked about <laughs> you know, in terrible terms, uh, you know, going forward, right? So just it's out here choosing violence today. <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying, look, I, I, I only... I bring facts to the table, sir. That's all I'm, that's all I'm doing. Um, but, but Joseph is, it's, it's, I think it's time to move on from, from Joseph that, you know, you cannot pay in a salary cap world what Pete, for what people have done. You get in trouble with that. If you pay for what people have done, instead you have to pay for what their potential is. And if Atlanta doesn't see that, then you have to move forward. Now, can we, uh, you know, agree to disagree on certain aspects on what the final minutes of his career in stripes look like? Sure. Great. Absolutely. Perfect conversation that, that can be had. But in my opinion, I think it's time to move forward. But uh, when it comes to replacing him, this isn't 2017 where you have boatloads of Garber bucks uh, uh, where it, you know there's so much uh, Garber bucks stashed away in, in the Scrooge McDuck money bin where, that it sloshes around anytime the, the the wind blows. Now you're on level with everyone else, and all these other new teams have to deal with their metric ton of Garber bucks. And yes, Jason, at the moment, yeah, we, because we have moved people out, we have Garber bucks. Yes, but we how are we replacing these people going forward? It's going to be different now because of what you know. Garth is going to view as a valuable addition versus to what was previously viewed as a valuable addition. And it's not a perfect science. It's not, uh, there, there, you know, there are stories out there of, you know, teams, uh, in, you know, I'll, I'll use my own Milan as an example. They spent $250 million post Berlusconi to get Milan back to champions league. And it kickstarted the banter era, which Milan has not had. It was a disaster zone, but they brought in $250 million worth of talent and it, they, it didn't work. Right. So it, it's, it's, there's something where you can talk about things that have gone bad, but there are things that have gone well. And I think Ricky Ricardo brings a, a perfect example for that that when you moved Barco and you were able to bring in Almada. Now you can talk about the cloud around Almada all you want. And I think that's, that's fine. But the, the, the issue that you, you have an issue replacing players that to me, I would have to push back on that. You know, you know, Gutman 
fantastic addition, right? How much uh, shock and awe was uh, surrounding Gutman whenever he was brought in, right? Uh, virtually none, right? Uh, I, I, you know, Brooks Lennon, I'll say, is a far better defender than Julian Gressel was. Julian Gressel had to be supported underneath by two players because of his positioning and, and how Tata wanted to use him. You know, when you're in a cap league, you replace how you can. I, I, I'm I, sorry that we haven't been able to replace current Premier League sensation Miguel Almiron. I mean, the guy was a unicorn, and you were able to get him. But it, it, no, Nick, no one's calling you dumb, man. No one's calling you dumb. Uh, we can disagree on things without having to worry about, you know, somebody being dumb, you know, considered dumb or whatever. It's not a black or white. There are shades of gray here. And the challenge I have is that we, we, are, dis, we are discussing something that people are emotionally and financially, you know, a part of. You're financially involved because you have tickets, right? And you buy jerseys and you buy scarves and you buy everything else. There's a culture surrounding it. But no one is saying that your opinion is dumb or that you're dumb that, you know, or I'm planting a flag on the moon with my position because damn it, I'm right. It's, it is an opinion that I have <clears throat> that Atlanta United has done a better job of replacing some people than have been, uh, than have been previously. And you can't get over the fact that I don't know if somebody buried a, a, a voodoo doll under the 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 training pitch or uh, under the stadium or what I don't know I have never in my life seen seen a string of injuries that happened like Atlanta United last year mm-hmm. right and and it wasn't like Atlanta was you know in a, such a, a crazy position where there were so many games where it looked like we were completely done and dusted and had no business being on the field they were still competitive even with the insane amount of injuries at that point you you were shooting dice in the back alley hoping to god you're hitting you're hitting the numbers sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't but it's we let's at least be intellectually honest with each other and say that it's okay that if you're on one side of a fence on a particular argument and we're on another side and we disagree with each other internally on on some things you know uh, me and jared and john and jason will have different views of things different views on how things should go but if somebody says I disagree with you. I'm, I'm not going to sit there and, and, you know, take the, you know, take moral injury from it. And, and I think that's the issue is we can't take moral injury from these discussions, guys. If I see you in the streets, if, if Jason, if I meet you, I, I'm going to shake your hand and, and hope that we can sit down and have a beer together. I'm not going to, I would certainly would not want you to think that, that anyone's insulting you for having that position. And with that, I'll step back. Okay, and, and Jarrett, once again, uh, you know, one of the things that we always try to remind folks is that just because you don't see anything public when it comes to transactions, it doesn't mean that they're not going on. And so you're, you're seeing some transactions, and you don't know how long that it was for the, these transactions were being you know negotiated one way or the other. We don't know how far back the discussions with Clement Giop or, or Quentin Westberg were. But it's, a lot it's, of the stuff is done in private. Good. No, just yeah. A lot of the stuff is done in private, and we won't know until it happens. Yeah, it's this is it's one of those things where it's hard to be team no leaks. Um, actually, next year the other day that apparently like the Braves are the KGB of Major League Baseball <laughs> because they don't leak anything, um, which makes sense because a lot of times that we've seen them put stuff out. The Hawks were like this when Danny Ferry was there. You wouldn't see anything until the press release. Like they were they were keeping stuff from like. Uh, Shams and Woj left and right. Mm-hmm. It's hard though, especially in soccer, especially when you start getting into you've got other countries involved. When it's internal MLS, you can do it to an extent, but even like uh, guys like uh, Tom Bogert can break it before you can put the press release out there. And that's fine. Uh, and you know, teams might put stuff out there and might might put it to somebody who they want to put it out there to get ahead of things and control who has that and who pushes it out, that sort of thing. Yeah. And um, there, there is, there is a level of, you know, uh, 
Department of Propaganda that happens in leagues, that happens in teams, happens in organ, happens in business organizations where you want things to leak a certain way. You want things to come out a certain way, whether it's by press release or whether it's by leaking through the right person in the right direction, so you can control the flow of this river down the mountain the way you want it to, so that it ends up in the right sea and not into a toxic waste dump. It is tougher though with especially in Atlanta's historical case with South America, because you have guys who were so locked in in South America, the, the S tier sources, that it's damn near impossible to get a deal done without somebody talking about it and somebody leaking it. And then everybody's got, um, you know, they have their tabs open on Hootsuite or Tweet Deck if Tweet Deck's still around, RIP if it's not, um, <laughs> where they can get information out. And you're just sitting there wondering, like, well, uh, we, 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 I guess we're, guess we're doing this, you know, as we're looking at it as fans a lot of time, like, Oh, okay. Well, I guess we got to go look this guy up because it's been, uh, I, I, I guess, uh, I guess it's been, I guess it's been coming. So we'll see what happens. Um, I don't know what's going to happen now for the rest of the month. Like I said, I mean, it's going to be interesting. I'm interested to see how it goes with signing somebody else, how it goes with signing, you know, more players because of the money you have freed up. Or, you know, as it's been mentioned, um, you know, Garth Lagerway, when he was in a different role in Seattle, was much more of a likes to make the splash in the summer kind of thing, see what I have, and then adjust the chessboard halfway through the game. That sort of thing. Whether that happens, that remains to be seen. But we've seen stuff come out of nowhere and be done in two or three days that might happen we might get rumors today that take the rest of the month to get cleared up and it might we might end up with a insert name here watch again yeah we can put it on the mantle next to viable watch and next to barco watch yeah yeah you figure that there's... we put remember we had a horn on the show oh absolutely for barco watch yeah we did yeah well that's let's also remember that even loggerways time in uh in seattle was not without um fan uproar right uh remember zombie sounders uh, yeah absolutely. the sounders oh, yeah. looked like they were dead in the water sounders right and everybody uh, the sounders fan base was going just absolutely ballistic why are we not bolstering this team why are we not adding people why are we not doing that why are we not and, and this is this is seattle they invented the sport right but um <laughs> They also killed the sport. Don't forget it. Yes, exactly. They they also embraced that in in true heel fashion. I appreciate that. Though. Right, and and what happened? Right, what happened to Zombie Sounders? Right, I, they shocked the world. It, it's what I'm. The point I'm trying to make is one. Like has been said earlier, it, some business does not see the light of day, mm-hmm. especially if it's stateside. Right. right? Um. Two, not every splash is a good splash. Look at Inter Miami uh, for the past couple of years. Uh, remember the press conference uh, where a certain gentleman with the last name of Bale said, "This is not a, a, a short-term deal mm-hmm. uh, with LAFC." Um, and now they are like, "Oh crap! What do we do to repeat?" Yeah. Right? Until until it's a short-term deal, right? Right. Until it's, yeah, until it's a short-term deal. Not every not every splash is a, is going to be a long-term hit. Not every move is the good move, and sometimes, it, it, you know, making a move for the sake of making a move is not the right decision either. Sun Tzu, the art of war. If you are uncertain of the terrain, do not advance the army. Uh, it, it's, you know, Lagerway has a history. Remember when, uh, remember uh, when uh, Hannibal literally dis- almost destroyed Italy by just letting the Italians, letting the Romans continue to make the first move? Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and then when, when the Romans decided to uh, get rid of Fabian and, uh, and put two chuckleheads in charge, they suffered the, the largest military defeat in the nation's history uh, when Hannibal said, cool, let's ride, and just laid waste to everyone. And then they went right back to the Fabian strategy all over again. Uh, we're going very nerdy here on yeah. SDH, but... Welcome, welcome to welcome to our welcome to our usual chats. Yeah, yeah. This is this. If you want to know what our normal back channel chats are like, that this is it right here. Yes, pretty much. But you know, it's okay right now to let Garth look because Garth is a process person. 
He's more interested in something that is repeatable and some, because if it's repeatable, it can be, there's a better chance it's predictable and that doesn't happen overnight. So he needs to see how the scouting department is getting things sorted. He needs to see how, what the, the player sourcing is like. He needs to see what the economic moves have been like, and then say, okay, we can make a refinement here. We can stop process here. We can increase process here. And it allows people to, to, you know, do their roles, to do their job. And at the same time, make subtle course corrections, right? I, I don't think from a strategic perspective, you're going to see a whole ton of change from, hey, look, we're going to be bring the best talent in possible to try to win. Every team's doing that. But it's it's the stuff from the bottom of the roster to the middle of the roster that's going to be the, the, the game changer as to whether or not you're a playoff team or whether you're a championship team. And when Atlanta had all the injuries that they had, oh. uh, then you had to put – people at the bottom of the roster and the middle of the roster and then people off the street and to try to be a playoff team. That's a uh, guys, that's extraordinarily tough. And I, I think that it just, it becomes an issue where you have a lot of management turnover, right? You had a lot of injuries mm-hmm. and that creates conditions that, you're more likely to fail than you are uh, to succeed. Garth bringing process into the, you know, and it's different. It's not saying that uh, that there was no process b- before, it's but the process, process, right? There's, and that's why if you look at business that goes from startup to growth stage, right? A lot of times you're switching executives during that period because the CEO who's really good at the startup is not necessarily the best at growth stage or is not necessarily uh, the bit at uh, the best at the top end uh, and then going into the you know the turn down slash renewal phase those are different types of leadership so it's going to be something where right now Garth may be the best person because Atlanta needs process more than anything else. They don't need a dynamic game changer. They need process. It's boring. I know boring does not equal splash, but boring can equal unprecedented success. If you let process work and that's what Garth had over in Seattle, he had a team around him. He'll tell you this as he told us in his presser that, they didn't have a, C, a quote unquote, uh, you know, CEO position available. Like he was going to be where he was in Seattle for all time until people just sort of moved along and matriculated out to retirement or whatever. That's why he came to Atlanta. He got uh, the opportunity to be CEO, to be the president. That's very different for him. So process is can be boring, but. It's a man who understands how to construct a roster that is sustainable. Right? It's not just a spike. We're not the Florida Marlins where it's you, you win a title and then you hit the tank and then you hit the title and then you hit the tank. It, it, process takes time. And so he understands, I believe, I believe he demonstrably, observably found players who can succeed, but not without occasionally having to pull the thing out of the mud, which is what all teams in a salary cap situation have to do. So just look back, guys. Look back in the history at Zombie Sounders and some of the other teams that, that where the fan base w- were calling for, you know, uh, the, the, the pitchforks and whatnot, and then watch them, you know, go and do things like win MLS Cup, uh, win Champions League, you know, the they know how to cook. You gotta let them. You gotta let them cook. You're not always wanting to know how the sausage is made, but baby, you love eating it. So, mm-hmm. you know, let's, let's figure out how it works. Yeah, I mean, and Jarrett and Garth Lagerway, this is his first chance to do something on the business side, as opposed to just being on the soccer side of things. And he's also only hit his key card, I think, for about a month. And so he's learning his processes at the same time as you're trying to build something for 2023. He is, and it's it, it's funny because like you don't. I, I risk making this comparison, whatever. I don't care anymore. Um, it's almost the end of the week, and I have next Monday off, so I'm in, like, <laughs> I'm in a good mood, whatever. Um, 
it's hard to make direct comparisons, but you look at you look at what other dynasties have built in other sports and what you're trying to create a lot of times is something sustainable and you'll have those boring stretches of it um, where you're trying to lay the bedrock. And I think that's, if you're Garth Lagerwey, that's what you're working on right now. You're trying to lay the bedrock down. Um, you know, how this goes, we shall see. Um, Cause I don't know how it's going to end up working. Like, I don't know how well it's going to work. Hopefully very well. well yes. Yeah. We got to wait and see. Um, I don't know what 2023 is going to look like. You want, you want it to look better than 2022. That's for damn sure. Yes. Um, does it? Hell, I don't know. Um, you got so much that you're trying to clean up and trying to fix that it's, it's hard for me to like pin it down because on top of all that, you know, you're replacing Joseph. You've cut a bunch of money loose. Um, you might lose your talisman number 10 in the summer. Um, I don't expect him to go in January. I don't know that anyone's going to throw that money yet, but I could see it in the summer. Uh, so you'll have other moves to make then. Um, it's a lot to unpack about the entire entire roster in mm-hmm. the grand scheme of things. Um, I know people are still big mad about Mateus Sato still being on the roster on his salary number. Um, I think it's much easier to stomach because you have – you have pruned so much of those big numbers off at this point. I mentioned Brad Guzan took a salary cut. Um, you mutually terminated with Everson Heinemann. I think it makes that easier to stomach and easier to ride out as time goes on. You also hopefully will start supplementing this roster with more homegrown players going forward. Yep. You know, and I know they are all on the roster. Like Johnny Fortune is on the roster. Uh, Justin Garces is on the roster. Jackson Conway on the roster. Uh, but beyond that, I think the hope, your hope is that those guys aren't just on the roster. They are doing what Vargas did for Seattle last year. Um, what Morris did for Columbus in MLS Cup in 2020. You want guys who can contribute out of that homegrown, who can be legitimate depth guys. And that's, I think, one of the things you're building towards at that point. Yeah. And, Nick, it is about building in both directions. You want to have the the homegrown element where your internal model is sustainable and the the availability and the capability to bring in those high price DPs. And yes, I did just use air quotes and all of this. You want to bring in that high price talent to supplement what you're building at the same time. Basically, you're looking for the best of both worlds in this thing as you're trying to build it in that in that manner. Yeah. And and I see in the chat, there's conversation about who checks who and in, in the organization. Um, I, I, you know, Garth, I think, has the ultimate the ultimate uh, veto power. Yeah. From uh, the, the, the hierarchy. I, I don't, uh, blank is not someone who's going to come in and, um, you know, and, and step in and be like, wait, 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 we're not getting rid of this one or this, or this guy. He's uh, not going to Jerry Jones. This, uh, no, he's not Jerry God. Jones. Correct. Perfect. perfect example, Jared. Um, you know, but let's understand that sometimes people left to their own devices, even if they're, if they have a, a track record of success, is not always the best thing. Um, you know, I, I go back to, uh, we'll, we'll go to the movies for ex- an example here. The movie Alien, mm-hmm. right? Uh, Ridley Scott, I think we can all agree, uh, phenomenal, legendary director, created a masterpiece with Alien. Until we get to the ending. Okay? And uh, you guys are like, wait a minute, what, what do you mean the ending? His original idea for the ending was that the, the creature kills Ripley and then records in, in perfect English the last survivor of the Nostromo monologue. And then the movie goes to black. He was also going to call the movie Star Beast. Now imagine Alien called Star Beast in the end with the creature that speaks perfect English cutting the last bit of the, uh, the last survivor of the Nostromo. I want to know who's going to voice the alien. I have to know. It, it would have been her. It would have, it would have been a pitch perfect replica uh, uh, replication of Ripley voice. I just having this image of like, I have in my head, um, this image of the alien killing Ripley at the end, 
picking up the recorder, starting to like clearing their throat, starting to talk, and it's like Bob Goldthwait. Right. <laughs> right. 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 Yeah. Okay. I mean, it, yeah. It, it's. It, I mean, the, the Gilbert Godfrey, right? Yeah. I'm the last surviving member of the Nostromo. <laughs> I mean, like it's. I mean, it's. It, it, it success he, and failure is on a knife's edge. Why is Polly Shore the alien? Right. Exactly. So uh, you know, with the Ripley. Yeah. So that's the whole thing. Is that is that the studio had to step in and be like, uh, no, Ridley, we're not doing that, and uh, we're going to do it this way instead. And they checked a great director. Right. Uh, you know, with the, when you hear about the stories, the numerous stories with the Rolling Stones, when Mick Jagger would go and do stuff, it was never as successful as when he did stuff with the Stones because he had Keith and Charlie Watts around to check him and be like, no, you idiot. We're not doing that. We're doing this stuff instead. Right. And it's the same thing uh, whenever Keith would go off and do his own thing. No, Keith. Sorry. It's just not that successful. Come back here and and play your role that you play so exceedingly well. And, uh, you know, Klaus Kinski, uh, phenomenal, insane, absolutely bat blank actor. But, uh, you know, he was able to get his best performances, uh, you know, whenever he had a director in front of him who knew how to make him, uh, Werner Herzog would get him to the point where Kinski, uh, Kinski would want to fight him and because he knew it would tire him out to the point where all that manic energy was gone and he would deliver this insanely beautiful performance. So it, people know how sometimes that to check someone else in a way that benefits everyone, even if internally it causes friction, you get the best out of everyone when that dynamic exists. So I don't think it's going to be something as clear as Garth, uh, sort of like, a you know, with, uh, Boca Negra on the marionette strings at all. I think it's going to be, you know, maybe at a check in, like, hey, from a process perspective, how are we evaluating this guy? How are we evaluating his contract? You know, what are we thinking on renewal or, uh, or, or the parting of ways? And then, I'm, you know, I'm sure Boca Negra will be like, well, it's this, this, and this, and this. And like, okay, all right. Well, you know, let me know if we need to uh, escalate anything or whatever. Go cook. And there may be times that Garth comes in and says, hey, yeah, I disagree with this. Uh, I'm just going to go ahead and put the gibosh. We're not adding this number of years or this option or whatever. And then Boca says, all right, cool, you know, and then goes and executes, you know. So it, it's – we have to see how the dynamic plays out, but it's never just one singular person has the right way of doing things all the time. Sometimes it takes people moving in concert to get the best performance. Uh Jared, I know that you are with us again tomorrow to finish up the week, yes? Yes, that is the game plan. All right, so that is the game plan. We'll catch up with you, Jared Smith, tomorrow. Thanks for hanging out, as always. Yeah. He's going to go into the real world now, and so it'll be uh, me and Nick. Uh, the, That's OG, right. the OG comes in and says, a reasoned conversation. It's somewhere between it's all effed up, burn it down, Boca out, and being a diehard sunshine pump or FO apologist. Is the fan base capable of that? That's what I mean. Legitimately, that's what we try to do every morning. Is, yeah. is try to to try to look at both sides and and give context to the situation uh, on a Monday through Friday basis. Well, well it, 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 with I, I'm try I'll try to put it this way. Mm -hmm. I am not a team employee. I don't work for the team. I do not have uh, roles and responsibilities where uh, I'm at the training ground interacting on a regular basis with the, with the very wonderful people that I've had an opportunity to work and interact with up there, right, from time to time. But I think in our role, everyone, meaning a, a, a host of a show, you know, co-host, whatever, however you want to break it down, if you run a show, you make a decision on how you want that show to be presented. And you can either be, uh, on one end, the extreme ultra supportive, you know, people do no wrong. And then on the other end, you can say, we are going to burn everything to the ground as, uh, as the, the, the great OG has said. Mm -hmm. It's not just a fan base that needs to, to understand where they sit on that scale. It's 
shows like this one and so many of the other great shows out there that need to figure out where they want to be on that. And, and what we try to do on this show is we try to say, okay, what is the context of what's going on? And we try to apply our best reasoning to the context. We don't try to say we are going to be a, a, a supportive show and go from there or a negative show and go from there. We say, what's the context and how do we go from here to here? And that puts people sometimes in a, a tough space because they feel like, you know, well, you're sunshine pumpers and you can't, you know, you're not providing, you know, us with a realistic perspective of what's going on. I'm sorry, but you know, for people who went after Jason last year, and I'll say quite viciously, you didn't have to sit on a plane with the very players you were expecting him to trash. And, and imagine that, right? So you're you're on you sit there and you're like, this player is garbage. You got to get him out of here. This guy's a bum. He doesn't do anything, man. Put him on the bench. Good God. And then you get on a plane. And you got to walk right past that guy. And there are some people out there be like, well, I would do it. Well, brother, good for you. But I don't know anyone who, if they said, hey, look, my employer's trash. My employer's no good. My employer's terrible. Uh, and, and, would, and put it all out there on social media and then would expect to have a job on Monday. Let's be real here. But if we provide context and with intellectual honesty and say, yeah, Last year sucked. It really did. Okay, why did it suck? Well, it sucked because, in my opinion, we had the most unbelievable run of injuries humanly possible. But we had players who underperformed as well. And then we had some players who couldn't get out of the injury, uh, the injury bug. And it sucks. And it happened. So, uh, you know, uh, we... When we provide context, that doesn't appeal to the emotional state because I think a lot of people get emotionally worked up and that's your job as a fan is to be emotionally worked up. It's your job to be, because when, you, when you're in the crowd and you get fired up, it's, it's your job. They want you to do that, right? Get loud, right? There, there's nobody in there who's emotionally neutral and is screaming their, their heads off in a stadium, right? They want you fired up. They want you emotionally engaged. It's a double-edged sword because when it goes bad, that emotional side, you want to get, you know, you want answers, man, because it's, it's hard to come down from the mountain. I, I'm not mad at people for being emotional about the team. And, you know, but I do think that if you have an idea of the, the type of conversation you want to have, which is it all sucks, burn it all down. It's terrible. There are, there are resources, teams, uh, uh, resources, shows, and everything else out there that are probably more your speed than what's being provided here, right? It's, it's, there's, there's morning talk radio uh, that you know, has music broken into it, and then there is you know, NPR. And, and NPR is not for everybody. The morning talk show uh, Zoo Crew is not for everybody. But in my estimation, I, I think there's different audiences and, and you're, you're always welcome here, but we're going to try to have conversations that are centered around context and intellectual honesty. Uh, well, Char, how you doing? You doing all right? I haven't seen you in a, in a while, but I really hope you're doing well. Um, but, you know, I really think that it's, you know, we... The team wants people to be emotionally engaged. Every team, every sports team wants people to be emotionally engaged. At the same time, let's try to, you know, at least attempt to look at things from the, the reality standpoint of it's not ultimate team. You can't just plug players in. You can't just plug a manager in. Um, and you can't just have everything go really, really well because you're the human joystick who controls all the players on the field. And the individuals, myself, Jason, uh, John and Jarrett, and uh, you know, hosts from other shows are not directly responsible for the player selection <laughs> or the injuries or everything else. But so, we'll be more than happy to talk about it on a day. Yes, 
Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and look, and, and, and to, to Niall's point, uh, uh, you know, the people who say burn it down, I, I will say that in some cases, and I know that guy, I'm going to get nuked on this as well. Sometimes the middle boring way is the answer. If Milan, Milan held on too long to the greats, right? They held on too long. They kept, uh, you know, Gattuso and, and I'm not going to say Maldini. I refuse to put that in his name <laughs> and staying too long, but Inzaghi and Ambrosini and, and a lot of these other guys and, and, uh, and, uh, and kept them on too long and didn't do enough to strengthen that roster from a youth perspective. And it became a burden. They couldn't get out from under it. So they had to burn it down. They didn't, they spent 250 million in really poor transfers and buried us. Right. And so, and so it's, it's something where, you know, there's a fine, line. I, when somebody says burn it down, I respect the burn it down idea because if look at New Orleans, the, the New Orleans Saints, they are in cap hell because oh. they didn't look at the roster and say, you know what, boys, time to burn it down. Mm-hmm. Just take our lumps, burn it down and get it started. There is room for the burn it down crowd. There is room for the burn it down crowd. Uh, you know, meaning that we're getting rid of everyone above a certain uh, salary threshold and we are going to clear all the bad contracts out and we're going to start from as close to ground zero as humanly possible. Uh, Next year in the NFL, the Bears are doing that and the Falcons are doing that. Now you can be somewhat competitive in that space while quote unquote burning it down. The Falcons, I think we're we're, we're pretty competitive this year uh, and they're going to have what 70 plus million in cap space. But when you clear the bad contracts out, it allows you opportunities to do a faster rebuild. And so I think that's what, and Amelia, I, I, Amelia, I certainly hope you, you don't believe I'm, I'm speaking down to you. That's certainly not my intention. Um, but I think there is room for the burn it down crowd. And I think there's room for the, you know, the let them cook crowd. The concern I have is whenever we can't find some sort of meeting ground in the middle that's centered around intellectual honesty and context that allows us, and our social media world's not built for that because no. that's not the, what gets promoted. That's not uh, the way that, that radio shows get great numbers. Um, and you can only do so much in 280 characters. You can only do so much. And and even on in our world of, of, the, of the podcast and the, the radio shows, uh, you know, we, I, I think we all understand that if we bring it from a, a thing of, let's talk about the dirt today. Look, I worked in radio, the tease, you know, and, and, yeah, Turner, I know, right. In this economy, good God, man. Uh, but it's, you know, but I, I worked in radio for years mm-hmm. Uh, and they would say, hey, Nick, uh, uh, on this particular video, can we get a little bit more ambiguity here? Can we get a little bit more of a tease? Can we get a little bit more of, of the bait? And, and it was just because you have to hook the listener for the next hour. You have to hook the viewer for the next video. You have to get that next ad served. You have to get that next, in this case nowadays, the next subscription. And so it's a part of our ecosystem. And so when somebody does not apply those rules in this ecosystem, uh, it, it, it really looks like somebody's coming at you in a weird, odd direction. And, and I promise you on all of our conversations, John, am I, am I, do, am, do I receive a paycheck for this show? No, you do not. No, I do not. Uh, not at present. That is the, that is the end game, but not at present, not at present. Um, you know, John, do we? How many times have have we ever discussed boosting the numbers on this show? Uh, artificially boosting the numbers? Never. Never. I, I don't. I don't recall any conversation where we sat down and said, "Oh, guys, man, phew, man, we're down listenership thirty percent." Oh God. Uh, I, because all we do is we talk about like, "Hey, look, let's talk about this tomorrow. Let's talk about that tomorrow. Let's talk about uh, whatever." And yeah. and we keep it. That's that's the show, right? That's what we do. And so whenever we talk about Atlanta United, it's not from a, 
you know, oh, this is going to get the people fired up. You know, we know that Joseph's a touchstone conversation. We yep. know it. But but we we know that I know the Mongolian numbers are slipping. I we got to get SOT yeah, back to get the Mongolian numbers up. No doubt. But um, but you know the the, the Joseph situation is a touchstone, and we understand that time has played a role in this. Injuries played a role in this. Personality has played a role in this. Community outreach has played a role in this. For for the tumping over the table in the locker room. After a loss of the of the team food meal, it's, it's also on the other side juxtaposed, uh, juxtaposed with the the stories of Joseph showing up at a kid's birthday party, right? Like a, a little kid's birthday party, Joseph shows up. Or in my own personal case, Joseph taking uh, my uh, taking his practice jersey off and handing it to my kid, right? And and I. I it's okay for these two things to exist in the same universe where you could say, man, this guy has argued and fought against every flipping manager that has come through this team. And this guy's done some really good things while he's been here, not just on the field, but in the community as well. But father time is undamn defeated. Mm -hmm. And, and I've watched players that I love fall victim to that. And, and fall victim to injuries and fall victim to time. And, and he may go on like a, a Brett Favre deal where Brett Favre leaves the Green Bay Packers and signs within the division and goes to the Vikings and gets ooh, this close to winning it all and then falling off the face of the earth. It, it, it can happen. But I would say that Green Bay was in a better position after that than they would have been had they kept Favre for a number of years extra. I would say that the, uh, one of the situations where this didn't work out as well is when the Dolphins went from Dan Marino to Cleo Lemon. Mm -hmm. God bless Cleo Lemon. I hope he's doing well. But, you know, it's again, sometimes it works really well. Sometimes it doesn't. And, and, that, and if we're going to be mad at anything, be mad at the city of Nashville. Yes. For, for that crap. stupid turf. For that stupid, that, 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 that ridiculous staple gun turf. That, yeah. that, that I knew as soon as they played on that damn field that it was going to be bad because that stupid turf looked like it was a bunch of dead muskrats staple gun to concrete. And, and I'm mad at that. I'm mad at that. Because that's the, 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 where it all started going wrong. You can adjust. You can have a situation. If Joseph doesn't get the injury... And let's say Joseph has a bad attitude. Let's 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 go into the land of uh, of hypotheticals here, and, and going in and saying, "All right, Joseph has a bad attitude, but he's really healthy. He's scoring buckets, and a manager can sort of course correct him to be a, a, a more chipper, sunny individual." Okay, then we're having a very different conversation today. But that's not what happened. That that stupid staple gun muskrat turf. If, An if Antonio Conte's head was a stadium, it was Nissan. Yes, yes, it's a bunch of it's a bunch of of, of Antonio Conte, uh, <laughs> you know, staple gun muskrat hair, along with William Shatner staple gun muskrat hair, mm -hmm. all over the place, and and we're having to, we're having the conversation built around what happened, mm -hmm. and what happened was that man's knee spontaneously combusted into a quantum singularity because of that stupid turf. Mm -hmm. And we are in the situation we are in today. And it sucks, but it has to happen. It could have happened differently, maybe better, but it's happening. We've been thrust upon this epoch and we must do the, uh, the best we can with it. So says legendary French photographer Jacques-Henri Lattigui. God bless you. Thank you. Uh, and uh, contributor Nile is also uh, claiming that the uh, chocolate pudding that was BMO should be blamed as well for for its impact on Atlanta. I believe uh, it was that uh, Tito and Kam and Kamar Lawrence was that uh, what uh, contributor Nile is chasing after there. So uh, we've got we've got that as well. And uh, you know you're looking at. Uh, and guys, as always, thanks for hanging out in the Twitch pitch and doing things this morning. Uh, no Titans game for five months after that. 
Uh, maybe it's like the Obama Yang situation. Oh, Brooks Lennon. Yes. Oh, Brooks Lennon. Yes, exactly. Yes, yes, yes. Brooks Lennon. And that was just by not having enough grass and slipping on a mat. That that's just like general upkeep. It's like, why do you have, why do you have a welcome mat just offside your surface? You know? Yeah. Right there with you, Niall. Uh, and by the way, Niall has returned for his uh, seasonal cameos when it comes to prem and proper. So uh, I think he's got one more before he has to head back to school. And so when uh, we get through Gummy Bear Cup semifinals, Manchester City lost to Southampton yesterday, by the way, two goals in five minutes. And uh, that was it. So semifinals in the Gummy Bear Cup, FA Cup was last weekend. Wrexham advanced in a crazy. But uh, we'll have uh, games this weekend. Yeah, it was like a slip and slide, no doubt. Um, but, yeah, you have the Brooks Lennon injury. It was a 20 injury, 17 players, and you had a roster of, I think it was 37. Did we make that count? 37 players last season that were a part of things for Atlanta United. But, yeah, I mean, what we try to do here is provide context. And the fact that we have all this space every single day is, uh, yeah, they do, Niall. Uh, you know, we try to, to give it the space and the conversation that it deserves because, Doing something in a 10 or a 15 minute chunk when you're trying to discuss something, it doesn't give it its due diligence or due, uh, due justice. So there's always a lot of stuff to talk about on a daily basis. And we can't thank uh, <laughs> Joe Bost. Yeah, Kamar Lawrence. Uh, and then uh, uh, Shuri Single. Welcome. I think this is the first time that, uh, that you've contributed into the Twitch pitch. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. We've talked a lot about CR37, Sharice. And, uh, yeah, we call him, C I call him CR 37 for a reason. And uh, if you haven't seen the video separately, uh, yes. And, uh, that we, we knew that with uh, Mateus Kleech, uh, we knew that was coming for DC, but it's officially official now, according to Nile, uh, the transfer and the contracts are in and all of that, uh, has come to pass. And so I want to see, uh, uh, I want to see how he integrates. I want to see what's going on with DC United and, and see how, uh, but once again, remember, Wayne Rooney is the odds on favorite to take over for Frank Lampard whenever uh, Everton decides to dismiss said uh, manager that they currently have on file. So does Wayne Rooney go back to Everton? And then what does that do to D.C.? Uh, Ernan Lasada is uh, in Montreal. So, I mean, we have all of this chaos uh, that is uh, that is going on. And I wanted to get into. Uh, a couple of other things this morning, but yeah, thanks to all of you guys on a daily basis that come in and hang out with us, especially in the off season when there's not MLS stuff to talk about. And uh, there's plenty of other things to talk about, but no, thanks for hanging out on a daily basis and, and being a part of the things that you always are incredibly <laughs> sure. Well, sure. He's, uh, that's a conversation to have when Jarrett's on the show. Uh, we need to have that in the first hour. I don't know if Chelsea can be shifted to the SPFL. It would help out the SPFL when it comes to competition, although folks like Aberdeen and Hearts might get a little mad. But uh, uh, morning, perfect, Tommy. Uh, but, yeah, there's a couple of other things to talk about this morning, and uh, we'll get into that. Uh, so it appears that folks, uh, Nick, are mad at Toronto for the slip and slide on Bru uh, Brooks Lennon's injury. Mm -hmm. and, they're, and they're also still mad at Kamar Lawrence just yep. because. So that, that is still that is still hanging out with folks this morning when it comes to, to injuries in Atlanta United. Oh, yeah, yeah. Look, I'm, I'm, I remember when uh, Kent Herbeck pulled um, Ronnie, uh, Gant. Yeah, Ronnie Gant off first base. Um where he was safe, and then suddenly Kent Herbeck pulled him off first base uh, in the 91 series and, and you know, was a hero in Minnesota mm -hmm. and was an absolute uh, ultra villain down here. So, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You know, so, uh, it, yeah, it, it's these are the things that, when we talked earlier about the emotional side of being a fan, these are the things that we remember, right? I, I remember Kevin Dyson uh, being one yard from yep. tying up uh, was right there when it happened. Yeah. That, and when, and, and because of that, because he was one yard short, people forget that Steve McNair did one of the ultimate legendary drives in Super Bowl history. He took the, the team 80 yards in a minute, 24 seconds. Um, and that was a running team. That was not a team built on passing and McNair, uh, you know, just put on a, an absolute show for a minute and 24 seconds. And that gets forgotten because of the emotion of the, the one yard uh, stop by 
by the Rams. By so, Mike Jones, yeah. Yeah. And so, um, you know, we remember these, these, these moments because they are emotional to us. They, they, they create core memories, whether we want them to or not, you know, so it's, um, you know, but there's, there's a lot of stuff in this, uh, in in our history in the Atlanta United history, like the staple gun, uh, to pay turf of Nashville, the slip and slide (laughs) of Toronto, um, you know, and the, uh, and, you know, so many other, you know, random weird things, uh, Minnesota and the sub zero games and, you know, freezer bowl in Cincinnati with the chargers and the Bengals. Oh it's yeah. 59 with the wind chill. Yeah. We always have those kinds of things. Right. But they're core memories, man. They're things that, that stick with us. You know? Michael had the 2004 Auburn screw job with an undefeated season. Absolutely. Yep, the Columbus underwater game where Mike and uh, Jason were in the end zone. Oh, Jesus, the that bar- one. The Barco tackle in the, in that one. This is yeah. airing, this is airing of grievances. This well, well, right, because look, I mean, when the right wing when when the right winger has to to you know run around Jacques Cousteau uh, on on the way trying to matriculate the ball down the field and essentially trying to do like a, the juggling the ball in the air because the ball won't move more than two and a half inches. Uh, you know, because of the standing water. Yeah, that Columbus game should have never happened. My God in heaven, it should have never happened. But here we are, you know. Yes, yeah. but yes, all of the bringing of all of the, yes, the, the bringing of all of the sports grievances this morning on a Thursday for Thursday thoughts. Absolutely nothing wrong with that. Right. A uh, couple of other things in MLS I wanted to get into uh, this morning. Yesterday, uh, Aaron Alasada who I am still looking forward to seeing how things are going to work with CF Montreal uh, impact uh, soon to be probably, hopefully maybe never that you had, you had that going up, uh, but Olivier Renard uh, got to get the discussion from Aaron on Lasada about Kai Kamara. And so apparently here's what happened with Kai Kamara. And now Kai is requesting a trade out of Montreal. So Amy Walsh on Twitter, Kai refused the terms of a new contract with CF Montreal. He tweeted he was pleased with his option Mm -hmm. that it was picked up by the club. The club got a letter from a doctor in Africa as Kai Mm -hmm. had been home with his family saying Kai is ill and unable to travel. The club asked for details, didn't get them. Aaron Lasada is asked about Kai's absence on Monday, says he's sick. Amy Walsh says you go on social media and it's otherwise. The club wakes up to Kai's post this morning about asking for a trade. His last contact was January 5th. A trade was table. It was a table option, but as a player under contract, they expected him in camp. Two-year contract was offered to Kamara, included a raise, no specifics on exact terms, a proposal to stay on with CF Montreal after retirement, first team academy or something like that. And according to Olivier Renard, the club also tabled contract options to help him with his family situation since his family still lives in Kansas City. So uh, drama with Kai Kamara in Montreal this morning. <laughs> this is so weird to me. It, it's it's it, something. It, there's some transformative process that has taken place from the time of, or he obviously did not. I mean, come on, let's be real. Like uh, the players are typically not putting out statements. It's almost always the representatives. Mm-hmm. And, um, and, and we'll get to the, do- the dog bowl. I'm sure. Yeah, we, we, we can, Airborne DJ, I'm sure we can get into dog bowl uh, here momentarily, but um, <laughs> but it it looks to me like the representative pulled the trigger on. We were so thrilled for the uh, the option pickup, mm-hmm. which is I mean that's that's lock, stock, and barrel of an, uh, an agent's job. Yeah, we are thrilled that this happened, and then. It, it sounds like uh, Lawrence was like, "Hey, hey, you weren't you weren't supposed to send that. That that was not really. I'm, I I went out." And then the agent's <laughs> like, "Wait, what? Like, yeah. I just sent this. I can't unsend it." Yeah, yeah, but I I really went out, and um, I would like to go to this, you know, something else instead of <laughs> here in in Montreal. Oh, oh, okay, uh, uh, okay. Just put the put out put out the. Th- we would like a trade. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only thing that makes sense to me, right? Yes. That, that an agent was not in contact with the the player, and the player wants one thing, and the agent was just doing what was supposed to be happening. Yes. 
Yeah. And as far as Monday night, perfect Tommy. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. As a neutral, I'm sorry. Um, but yeah. And, and I love the people who are like, TCU should have never been in there. But brother, they hung 50 on Michigan. Yep. Who else were they going to get? That's another, that's a Michigan problem that needs to be addressed more than anything. I, I tell you this, and I know this is not college football down here, but I'm going to uh, uh, prepare yourself, John. Yes, I'm prepared. Prepare yourself. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, I'm locked in here in the seat. What's going on? Georgia right now to me. Looks like they could be the new Miami. Where you dun, had like, dun, dun. yeah, baby. Where you J- had, Jason's happy to hear you say that. But well, I'm talking about they could be the new Miami. Something absolutely, absolutely insane. The level of talent coming through that program. Well, and you you look at as long as they don't come down the down the the airplane uh, stairs dressed in camo. Why? That was beautiful. Uh, excuse me, where did I go to school, sir? Well, yeah, I went to Florida State. You went to yeah. Florida State, I know. Yeah, and having to deal with that nonsense. Look, everybody and their mother knew that Pat Carter was going to be doubled uh, by the Blades brothers in the back of the end zone on the two-point conversion at Doak Campbell Stadium, and Danny McManus threw it there anyway. I, I, look, I'll, I'll say this. I, my, uh, my family, we're big, I mean, obviously big Catholic family, and, and they don't have a team called the Fighting Italians. But um, <laughs> so a lot of the family is huge Notre Dame fans, huge. And so, uh, in 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 down in Savannah, we had a little TV room um, in my grandparents' house, and they were all in there. They're all in their Notre Dame colors, and I was obsessed with Miami, all things Miami, anything doing with Miami, I was obsessed with. And I walk in and I go, Benny Blades. And oh, no. One uncle grabbed uh, my right arm and right ankle. The other uncle grabbed left arm and left ankle. They used my head to open the door like on Casino. And they slid me across the hardwood floor and told me for the rest of the day I was not allowed in the TV room. <laughs> um, uh... So, yeah, yeah, that that's... Yeah, Miami, my, and when, you know, Miami uh, did big things, I was always a happy camper when I was down there. But, you know, look at what, uh, look what George is doing. How many transfers do they have on that team, right? They did uh, almost all of it building up, uh, you know, building up internally, right? Mm-hmm. Building their squad internally and, and you know, Cruton. You know, yeah, I think there's something to be said about that. Yeah, you know, you know, you know why, why not Crute and keep everything in-house? You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and look at Ajax. Ajax does the same thing. You know, they, they, they Crute, you know, they, they get them in, and, and they build up internally, and they move the players on. There's a, there's a conveyor belt. Yep. And so, you know, like with, with what you and Jarrett um, and Jason talk about all the time with the, the academy and the twos and how you build a program – uh, you know, if we apply some of that college football logic, I mean, obviously we have the college football passion <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> judging on some of the comments, Absolutely true. nothing wrong with that, nothing wrong with that. Cause you need it. But, um, cause Hey, passionate people spend money. Uh-huh. So, uh, you know, but if you, if you know, get that conveyor belt mentality going, you know, I'm just saying, yep. Uh, the, the perfect Tommy, uh, just to let you know, one of the triggers for me on, on a daily basis oh, God. is that particular individual who oh, is the man. current head coach. Uh, it's got ATM on side the helmet, Nick. Oh, God. Yeah. And so it, any triggers uh, involving that quitter, uh, I don't even identify him by name. The fact that you did perfect, Tommy, that I will, I will defer to you in referring to that particular individual. I don't even call him by his name. I have about a I have a string of of predicate nouns that would make mm. Nick proud mm. whenever I'm ever discussing that particular individual. So yeah, I have zero desire to reference anything other than the fact that in College Station it says ATM on the helmet and you got twenty seven players in the portal. But that's just me. Hey, two plus two is four, minus one is three, quick facts. Mm-hmm. Absolutely true. Uh, also on the board this morning, uh, one of the other things I wanted to get into is a, an article by Henry Bushnell over at Yahoo. And it appears that MLS is going to uh, try and have the temporary concussion sub in 2023. Uh, Bushnell has uh, MLS could become the first professional soccer competition to allow temporary concussion subs 
pending a potential vote by the sport's global rulemaking body next week. IFAB, which determines and regulates the laws of the game, are meeting uh, a week from yesterday. So that would be Wednesday. They're meeting next Wednesday in London. On the agenda, according to two sources familiar with the discussions, is the issue of temporary subs, which have been the subject of an escalating push by some leagues and player unions. FIFA Pro and the World League's Forum, an organization representing 45 top-flight men's leagues spanning six continents, wrote to IFAB last month to urge, in quotation marks, it to permit trials of temporary subs, which would allow doctors to more thoroughly assess players in cases of suspected concussion. IFAB and FIFA have previously resisted uh, similar advocacy, but in recent months it's gained force. While many of those 45 leagues have not actively called for temporary subs, FIFA Pro and the WLF wrote that Major League Soccer and the MLSPA are ready to start a trial by the beginning of their upcoming season. It also stated that the Premier League, sorry, the Prem, Prem. and uh, League oh, were ready to implement the change at the start of their 23 24 seasons in August. Uh, Richard Masters, the CEO of the Prem, and Don Garber both sit on WLF's three-member management board. Uh, Soccer remains the only uh, world's only prominent contact sport that does not, according to Bush Schnell, under any circumstance, allow a substituted player to re-enter a match. So uh, we could be six days away from uh, common sense in in Major League Soccer. Crazy, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Crazy. Uh, And, and yes, um, uh, uh, Airborne DJ, I I acknowledge your tweet. I acknowledge that your tweet has happened. (laughs) That's as much as you're getting out of me with it, but I acknowledge acknowledge Uh your tweet. Um, Look, I I think that there's there's room for innovation. And I'll, you know, sometimes it comes from unexpected places. You know, Skycam was not always a thing. Skycam was not always, uh, you know, this, the great, wonderful thing that it is now in college football and uh, professional football as well. It took Vince McMahon and the XFL to try to radically shift how people watched the game and they wanted it to look like a video game because they knew that's what the kids were used to. Mm Mm-hmm. And so they wanted a camera that could almost lower down into the huddle and then, you know, pull back and give you the video game look. And that's in in the NFL that, you know, was just like, you know, absolutely not. We will not change anything. Looked at that and go, oh, wow, that's a really good idea. Mm -hmm. And boom, (laughs) sky cams everywhere now. And we're all, you know, we're all the, the richer for it. So if the world needs an incubator for new and crazy ideas. PK run-ups in overtime. PK run-ups in overtime. <laughs> Give me a 35 yard sprint. Yeah. Yes. Uh, you know, I have no problem with MLS being that because if MLS is, is going to show teams how to operate in a fiscally sustainable way, which it's already happening. Um, amen. If they, look at possibly imposing something of a salary cap. So we don't have the same three or four teams nonstop at the top of the table. Amen. If we get new camera angles, new types of media, amen. And if we get something that's so common sense, so basically needed and yet idiots refuse to we could not change the laws of the game. La, 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 t, t, t. Uh, you know, <laughs> as a concussion sub, uh-huh. it makes so much. I mean, come on. You want to talk about keeping the integrity of the game, checking a player out, a really good player for a concussion and saying, okay, you can come off for a little bit. Okay. You can come back on. All right. Now we're keeping the game as even keeled as humanly possible within the confines of the game and you don't have to break the world to do it. I think it makes all the sense in the world. Uh, Every other sport does this. Every other sport has where you could sub someone on and sub someone off. And do I think that we need to have it where you could sub all the players? No, but I do believe that having something as common sense as this, if MLS gets to be, the canary in the coal mine, I have no problems with that. And I think it makes all the sense in the world. And I applaud MLS for taking the steps to, to make a common sense improvement to the game. 
it appears, according to the, the Bushnell article, uh, IFAB governed jointly by FIFA and the four British football associations, England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, Wales. They reportedly plan to meet next week prior to the IFAB business meeting to craft a joint position on concussion subs. The English FA, the most powerful of the four, is a known proponent of temporary subs. But there is a quirk in the governance of IFAB, according to Bush. Now, the British FAs could vote to approve a trial next week. FIFA could then, in theory, overrule them at IFAB's annual general meeting in March. Uh, at, a, at the business meeting, to, uh, typically takes place in the fall, pushed back until after the World Cup. Each of the five organizations that sit on IFAB gets a vote. When they vote, they need only a simple majority for approval. At the AGM, however, each of the British FAs get a vote. FIFA gets four, and they need a three-fourths majority to ratify any new law. Uh, one source citing the quirk suggested the British FAs likely wouldn't force through a vote next week if FIFA weren't on board. In the past, FIFA has opposed temporary subs. FIFA spokespeople did not immediately respond to an email from Bushnell asking whether that stance has changed. If there is no vote next week, there still could be one March 4th at the, at the AGM, a week after the MLS season has started. On behalf of Major League Soccer, FIFA Pro has pushed for a green light from IFAB before the 2023 season kicks off February 26. One source to Bushnell, however, said Major League Soccer would be willing to implement temporary concussion subs mid-season or whenever IFAB allows it to. So it looks like uh, Major League Soccer is in the starters blocks uh, uh, when it comes to implementing the concussion sub and you know, they're ready to go whenever they get the okie doke, you know? And so I'm, I'm hoping that common sense prevails here and that you get this vote and that you don't have to, you know, and that, that FIFA's stance changes, frankly, but uh, looking forward to this vote next week. And we could be this much closer to temporary concussion subs because it makes too much entire sense for it to happen, which means it probably won't. See, if, if I had, if I had, uh, you know, Tony Stark money. Yeah. So like, so like tomorrow, like today when you go out and get your, uh, uh, mega millions ticket. Oh no, that, come on. That's, that's pocket change to these guys, man. Okay. But I'm talking about like, if I had, if I had like stupid money, okay. I would just call FIFA up and be like, guys, look, we know how this works. We are all aware. We're all businessmen. Okay. So how much money is it going to take for you to implement the following rules, the concussion sub, um, banning Lazio from having fans in the stadium if they can't control the racist idiots. Yes. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and actually, you know, creating a, a, a World Cup that uh, does not require um, uh, slave labor to build stadiums. I, I, what, what can we do? How, give me a number. And let's talk about that. That's what I would probably be doing with my money. I wouldn't buy Twitter. I wouldn't buy a social media network. I would I would go and use stupid money to m- minorly improve my own life. So like the Gilbert Godfrey scene in Beverly Hills Cop where he's got the ticket in one hand and he's asking uh, Axel Foley, so what would it take? You know, you, you have this in this one hand and you have all this stuff in the other hand. And all of a sudden you're focusing more on the other hand. And just all of a sudden mm-hmm. it's like, oh, what, what is this that I have in my hand over here? It's a thing you're paying, not paying attention to it. That Rest guy. in peace, Gilbert. Yes. Uh, uh, well, okay. So David, David brings up, can we also uh, institute something to stop this holding your head and faking? Like holding your head resulting in immediate stoppage. If there's no contact, just throw an automatic yellow card. I mean, if obvious uh, faking head injury. You know what, David? I actually have no problem with that. Because if you have a concussion sub, then just like we do for targeting in, uh, in, in American football, every hit where they think there's targeting, it's reviewed. Mm-hmm. And so if you have a, a player who's trying to get... So you want flop reviews then? Well, I mean, just like we do for targeting... Uh, through nefarious means, you're trying to utilize uh, a concussion sub, uh, you know, and you bring on, a, you know, some stud striker who happens to not be able to run particularly far that game, but <laughs> it's a free kick situation, and this guy's really stupid good at free kicks. I have no problem with running something that looks uh, essentially like we would do it for targeting and say, okay, we have concussion simulation, yellow card. Yeah. 
I have no problems with that. And I think it's fine because I have personally used uh, fake head injury to get refs to buy in to, you know, helping me and my team. And, and it's very easy, right? So especially when you're short, if you clip the heels of the person in front of you, uh, just barely to where they're trying to keep, and you have to time it right, you know, the mid stride is typically when you do it. So mid stride, you clip the heels barely. Right. The arm flies up because they're, they're just trying to keep balance. And the ref is behind you, especially if they're positioned directly behind you. They don't have a sense of depth, right? They don't hit, they don't have a, a sense of Z scale. So that when the arm flies back and you launch, you grab your head and you take your own legs out from underneath you and hit the ground it looks like you've been fouled in the head. Now, when you hit the ground, this is where the, the, the you must nail this part. Remember when uh, you were like a teenager, you had a zit you were trying to pop, so you kept uh, trying to poke it, and yep. it became red and stupid inflamed? Yep. Well, you use the meaty part of your hands, and you squeeze your head together right where you want your simulated injury to be. Squeeze it really hard, get it red and puffy, oh, wow. and then point to the ref, and you have a red, puffy thing on your head where it looks like you've been hit ref throws the yellow card you get the ball back and now the ref knows okay this is a very physical slightly dirty team that i'm refing here now i'm going to pay extra close attention to them and meanwhile you're a-okay no concussion no nothing as a master of the dark arts i must uh you know take a role in the defense against the dark arts by saying <laughs> we need this sort of anti-targeting anti-injury fakery review to take place and it should be carded if found okay if you're gonna yeah. be a magician be a good one that's yeah. all i'm saying yes that's the thing is if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna be if you're gonna try something be good at it yep. and make sure that you can do what it is that you're setting out to do that's right uh transactions in uh, major league soccer mateus cliche is official for a dc united uh, RSL re-signed Zach McMath, the keeper, to a contract extension. Uh, NYCFC re-signed homegrown midfielder Justin Hack and his uh, massive flow to a deal. And the Chicago Fire signed keeper Jeff Gall on a free transfer from Degger Fours in Sweden uh, through the 23 season club options for 24 and 25. So the Chicago native comes home with, uh, with Jeff Gall. 75 appearances in all leagues and comps. Uh, was with uh, Lidkopings in 16 before traveling to BK Forward, scoped to AIK, and he played at Creighton, transferred to Virginia, played at MLS next. So Jeff Gall comes home for uh, Major League Soccer. Uh, transactions around the world. The world. Yes, and we also have uh, TV viewing for today as well, for those of you who will be in front of your, your uh, TV devices. Uh, Manchester United, Chelsea, considering moves for Kyle Walker-Peters. Southampton might be on the verge of a fire sale anyway, so dive in. Uh, West Ham spoken to Amiens about uh, Senegalese defender Formos Mendy. Leeds making progress in a deal for Hoffenheim's uh, U21 striker Jorginho Ruder. Uh, that looks like it might be in the neighborhood of 30 million euro. Spurs have decided not to trigger an option in the contract of Lucas Mora to extend his stay behind uh, beyond this season. Villa have had a bid rejected for Marseille's uh, midfielder Matteo Ginduzzi, who played under Unai Emery at Arsenal, probably for the better. Uh, Wolves are stepping up talks over a £10 million deal over Nice. Midfielder Mario Lamina, who played for Southampton and Fulham. Wolves want to sign Brazilian defender Felipe from Atletico Madrid. Uh, speaking of Atletico, they could move for uh, Soyuncu from Leicester. Sorry, Nick, as Felipe's replacement. West Ham will block any move from Mikael Antonio, who is of interest to Wolves. Uh, Fulham planning to offer manager Marco Silva a new contract following their run in the Prem. Championship side, Watford want to sign 21-year-old uh, Facundo Palistri for Manchester United. Chelsea, uh, Chelsea's Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang wants to return to Barca. Well, he, ain't mm. playing, he ain't playing at Chelsea. Uh, Villa willing to listen to offers for Luca Dina only a year after his move from Everton. Oh, yeah. Uh, Chelsea's Jorginho set to leave on a free this summer. He favors a return to Serie A rather than extending his contract. Nick, that's from our friends at the Telegraph. Yeah, people who leave Italy typically want to get back as quickly as possible. The quality of life is infinitely better, even if you're making less money. And not just that, but I mean, we like let's let's 
the English media are villains. And so um, <laughs> they, why would you subject yourself to that? I, I'm shocked that he stayed post Euros, to be honest with you. Um, you know, the build up to the World Cup for him, the World Cup qualifying was a disaster zone for Jorginho from the Euros all the way up to qualifying. He, he missed penalties. He got, he got the yips in front of the net. Um, he could, he could still play a role on the field from a distribution standpoint, but he just had the massive crisis of confidence. I think getting back to Serie A will be the best thing for him now, whether or not Napoli can afford him or he'll make himself available for Napoli is, going to be interesting to see, but you know, yeah, it, it, there's a reason that spend enough time in Italy. You'll understand that. Yeah. If I have to choose between that, <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. you know, it makes sense. Uh, I'm trying to look up uh, Ricky, the game. I want to say it was in the 2020 season because that was in uh, the season that he had the most reps because uh, everybody is now wondering when it was the, the match that Diop stood on his head for uh, CF Montreal, uh, probably, hopefully, maybe impact uh, against Atlanta. I've already accepted all of the pop-ups, Transfer Mark. Come on, man. It's like, you know, it's like, what are you doing? It's like, I've already accepted this. And then they ask you the same question every single time that you pop up. Do you accept? Yes, I accept. Come on. Stop talking. Uh, all right, so... Uh, MLS in 2020, waiting for that stuff to load. I know this is tremendous uh, radio and television material. Uh, all right, so no, that is not what I wanted. Okay, so second to last match day, subsequent competitions. No, that is not what I wanted. I wanted when Diop was in Major League Soccer. I want his 2020 statistics. That's what I want. I don't want the 2020 statistics for the league. I want the 2020 statistics for Clement Giop in those games. All right, so if we click on this one. All right, so 2020, Clement Diop. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. It looked like he lost. It was a loss 4-1 to Atlanta. I think it was the July, well, July 29th, 28th. No, let's go to 2020 here. Uh, did he play against Atlanta in 2020? Doesn't look like he did. Uh, so I'm trying to figure out, I give up. I know that somebody does. Wouldn't surprise me if, uh, all right. So he was on the bench here. So in 2020, did he go up against Atlanta United? No, he did not until May 16th of 21. There was the two, two draw in August of, I think it was probably the two, two draw where he wasn't on the squad. So I have no idea. These stats are, these stats are bugging me. I can't figure it out, but, uh, yeah, everybody remembers when Clement Giop stood on his head against Atlanta United and you're just hoping you did well no you didn't it's there we always the production wall Ricky is always there so it's like when we we always try to answer a question when it is posed to us and if you break through the production wall then it's just you know we're talking it's it's workshopping it's not quite a production wall we're workshopping it yeah well, and of course well, I can't find it well, well no but we the, I think we workshop uh, quite publicly though oh no you know? question yeah we don't we don't we don't pretend to <laughs> No, <laughs> you know, it's not like the Joe Rogan, like J Jamie looked that up. We don't have that. No, we don't no. have a Jamie look it up. We have us looking it up. Yes, exactly. So that's, that's our, uh, that's yes. our thing. And, we, and that's part of the trade-off though, right? Yes, it is. It, it is definitely that. So at some point, uh, I want to say it was the August uh, 21 uh, version with Clement Diop, but uh, don't quote me on it because uh, our, our friends at uh, Transfermark, they're not helping me out. You know, it's mm -hmm. like they're, they're not helping me out. Uh, so we, I was fishing. I couldn't find it. And so what else is new? Yeah. We don't know. Yeah. We, we it, don't know. It exists somewhere in the ether Yeah, and, uh, where he wasn't on the bench. So it was, it was either in, uh, 2019 in, uh, what's uh, September, October, so sept late September of 2019 in the 1-1 draw, or it was, uh, where was it? Yeah, I think that was it then. I think it was in that one where it would have it had to have been there. So that one in the 1-1 draw where he stood on his head. Uh, all right, so uh, viewing habits today. Hmm. Uh, NWSL draft is at 6 on CBS Sports Network and on Paramount+. Plus. 
Uh, the Deuce has Supercopa semis with the Betis and Barcelona on them and on Deportes. Two to NA has Liga MX in the Clausura at nine with Atlas and Mazatlan. The Plus also has Betis and Barcelona on at two o'clock. Paramount Plus, Copa Italia, Fiorentina, Sampdoria at noon, Roma, Genoa at three. Nick, Copa Italia this afternoon. Yeah, it's uh, Milan does not like Copa Italia that we always end up losing against uh, Manchester City doesn't like the Gummy Bear Cup apparently either. No, no, and they are big mad about that too. Two I mean, goals in five minutes, and then uh, Southampton gets the Duke. There, there are some City fans that are just big, big mad about not <laughs> doing well in the Gummy Bear Cup, but okay, uh, you know, I, I, I get it. Yeah, the um, you know, the the. The same thing with Milan and Coppa Italia. I don't know what it is with with us in Coppa Italia. We just don't. It's not our thing. I've accepted it. Um, I don't get big mad over things like that anymore. Mm-hmm. So um, I just smile and nod and say, okay, yeah, we, we have a Scudetto in recent memory. So that's okay. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's, that's all I can do. That's Hey, we got a Scudetto and that's all I'm hunting. That's it. That's all I can do. That's and it. Then- Fulham and Chelsea's at three o'clock on Peacock. So that is your, your viewing habits on your Thursday. Uh, would you put it past uh, Lionel Messi to be playing in the 2026 World Cup? No. His, his, uh, uh, from a style perspective, from a style perspective, he can do it. The question is going to be, can he can, can his body hold up until then that's going to depend on the league he's playing in if if he's still trying to do champions league and all that no absolutely not i think he's going to have to make a decision because there's only so much rope to to use here so you can either pull in one way or you can pull in another but you can't i don't think that even someone who with a galactic talents such as his can have it all in that perspective from the 2026 side uh, it's argentina uh, messi could be sitting at home for six months uh, to a year and argentina would be like hey uh do you do you, do you want to come to the 2026 world cup <laughs> well guys i mean don't we have players no 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 we're not asking them we're asking you we're asking you do you mm-hmm. want to do you want to go and so he, he he will have the option of doing it uh, i think what I think is going to happen, and I, I Ricky, I, I, I agree with you on this. Uh, I think that I think he's going to do a Copa America. I think he'll do one more Copa America, and that'll be it. I think that'll be the long and short of it. I, I don't, I don't agree with the whimper aspect of it because in Argentina there's no such thing as winning a World Cup and ending anything on a whimper. I mean Diego um I think Diego found the mother load of cocaine and um and and you know glandular issues uh and still was revered as a as a lower G god. So um I don't think that's going to happen. Yeah, no, I get it. I, I get what you're saying. I just don't think what what we call a whimper is the greatest as the greater soccer audience. Yes, I think we would probably call an Argentina failure in twenty twenty six a whimper. I don't think he necessarily views it that way. I want to see where he goes because allegedly, allegedly, there's a Saudi team that wants to pay double <laughs> what Ronaldo's getting to bring in Messi. Mm-hmm. Um, I I yeah. It's going to be interesting. I mean, the man, look, he's still doing it. Yeah. At PSG, he's still doing it. And PSG has the means to surround him with a really stupid team where they can say, look, Messi, if you want to walk, buddy, for like 82% of the season and then just ball out in Champions League, we are, we are completely okay with that. Um, he may stay at PSG for a bit if that's the kind of the deal that that he has with them, you know. Which I wouldn't be shocked if that was the case. But I don't know. It's it's interesting. I love the idea, the conversation in general. I love it, and it's not a cop out. I I just love the conversation of will he, won't he? Because it's so fantastical that he 
it's even remotely possible that we could see Messi in a 2026 World Cup. But it's not out of the realm of possibility. Like it's it's one of the two things. It's it's like it's like sending a human to Mars. Is it like does it seem impossible? Yes. Is it possible? Also, yes. <laughs> so <laughs> it's really spectacular. You know, it's like Bluetooth technology back in the eighties, or you know, Wi-Fi in the eighties or the nineties even. What do you mean we we can do something besides dial up? This is incredible. Mm-hmm. So, what are you talking about, sir? Yeah, I think I think we have itemized it because there was the big save that Diop made on Ezekiel Barco on a free kick just outside the 18. So we think it is the uh, September 29th, uh, 2019 one one draw against Atlanta United. So that's the mm-hmm. that's the Clement Diop workshopping of the day. Uh, also, let's see what. Oh, because I was going to tell you who said it. It was uh, Scaloni. Scaloni claims Messi could feature in the 26 World Cup. He made the statement during an interview with Spanish radio station Calvia FM. Messi would turn 39 during the tournament, quoting mm-hmm. Scaloni. I think Messi can make it to the next World Cup. It'll depend on a lot. It'll depend a lot on what he wants and what happens over time, that he feels good. Door will always be open. He's happy on the pitch. And for us, it would be good. Despite the comments Messi previously stated, it would be his last. He told ESPN that it was his last in October. But, uh, yes, he, he, is not, uh, he is not slowing down. But Scaloni... Scaloni says it may be. Hey, it's better to be in this situation. It's better to be Scaloni than the president of the French Federation Mm -hmm. who said, I wouldn't even pick up the phone if Zidane called it. And he's gone. (laughs) So so, I look real G's move in silence. You know what I'm saying? But yeah. uh, Oh, and speaking of, did you see that uh, that, uh, Stevie G is in the running for the Poland national job? The, yeah, Stevie, the Polish national. No, yes, no. yes, so there's a Stevie not. G is uh, possibly, probably one of the names that they're looking at for Poland. Why? Why? <laughs> Why? Why? What, what, what's he doing now? I uh, believe uh, probably picking up a paycheck every two weeks, direct deposit. And that's about it. From who? Uh, Villa. Ah, okay. Where he's no longer employed. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah. <laughs> hey, hey, look, you know, if um, I, there are some teams that I think would embrace somebody coming in from outside the culture and shaking things up, Poland ain't one of them. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I, 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 I wouldn't do that in Poland. I wouldn't do that in Italy. I certainly would not do that in Germany. Um, no, no. <laughs> Good luck. Because look, <laughs> hard man tactics won't work there. I can tell you that. If you're yeah. not, if, Polish is one of those languages, and I only say this because uh, one of my very, very best friends, uh, he and his wife are are, are Polish, and um, they, because I've made the joke of like, well, you know, one day I'm going to learn Polish, and I'm going to shock the hell out of you, and he's like. No, you won't, because there's like 37 <laughs> different ways of saying eating breakfast. Mm-hmm. And each one is like determined upon like tense time, a specific time, the specific, like all these different variables factor in to where unless you're a native speaker, like it, people are just going to be like, yeah, yeah, just shut up and speak English because it's not, <laughs> you're not making any sense. So it's nothing. It's not like where you could learn like Spanish, French, or Italian and and pass, you know, as remotely competent. It, in Polish, is like the lang- like the even the alphabet doesn't make sense. Like the language, it's a Slavic language that is like that uses, you know, our alphabet. Like, mm-hmm. wh- yeah, huh? Well, I mean, uh, I can go about as far as saying Vasilich Shviat. And that's because I knew one of my best friends in high school was of uh, a Polish family, and they're from Western New York. And so I got about as far as saying Merry Christmas and uh, and asking how you're doing. I can do Merry Christmas, Vesolich mm-hmm. Sviat, and I can also do – I can get into a conversation. I just can't get out of it. I can sit there and I walk up to somebody and go, Jak uh, which is how you doing. And then if somebody says they're okay, they go Dobrze, and then you keep going. And then that's mm-hmm. a, I can't go any further. Right. That's about it. It's like, uh, Merry Christmas. How are you? I can do that. And that's it. 
I, I will I will also suggest um, you know obviously this isn't a you know appeal to everyone. This is more of a PSA. Never ever ever getting into get into a drinking contest against a hey. Polish person. Hey. You're not going to win. I don't care if you're as Irish as Irish could be. I don't care if you are German. I don't care what your genetic background is. You're not hey. out drinking a Polish person. No man or woman. I don't care. It's not happening. Mm-mm. Good luck to you. No. No, yeah. Stevie G, stay home, buddy. Stay yeah. home. You don't, don't want that heat. Don't do it. Don't do it. But yeah, that's uh, that was one of the conversations that has been had uh, yesterday. That he is on their short list, so we'll keep an eye on that. Uh oh, uh, our our intrepid producer Ricky Ricardo uh, is uh, going to. He's put something in the in the chain, and uh, yeah, I saw that about uh, Richard Rufus jailed after defrauding his friends and family. So I think it's seven and a half years. Uh, in the Who's Gal for defrauding friends and family out of 15 million pounds. And so, yeah, saw that this morning. And so uh, Richard Rufus, he has now been jailed. And it's a seven and a half year term for uh, Richard Rufus. So we'll keep an eye on that. Probably talk a little bit about that in the next edition of Prem and Proper as we as we roll forward. But uh, Nick, as we are now officially past 11 o'clock parting shots, sir, what else is on your mind this morning before we go? Uh, Shakira absolutely cooked PK. Yes, we did, we did that in the opening kickoff, and I have yet to get your thoughts. Cooked him. Cooked <laughs> him. What a dork. Good Lord. PK, you're a dork, son. My God. Just 20, like, 29 million listens in 15 hours. Cooked him on a global scale. Took off, nuked the entire site from orbit. Um, you know, I... I mm-hmm. Nope. Nope. Just walk away, son. Just walk mm-hmm. away. Yep. We're going to find PK. Like they're going to do a documentary. It's going to be, it's going to be Werner Herzog's last documentary. We are now approaching <laughs> the idyllic hermitage of Gerard PK, where he went to hide and live in obscurity after his ex-wife absolutely Chernobyl him <laughs> upon social media and all types of musical art. Mm-hmm. And like, he's going to step out. He's going to be like, he's going to have the horseshoe, you know, where he has like no hair in the middle, just the horseshoe grown out yeah. the long beard. And he's going to go away. I'm not here to speak to you. Uh, uh, yeah, it's going to be, I'm telling you Oscar winning, Oscar winning that uh, documentary. And, and Werner, if you're listening, uh, I will, I will be your cinematographer. So there, just let yes. me know. Absolutely. Outside of that, I have nothing else because that was the obliteration was so total and complete. <laughs> <laughs> that um, even Vince McMahon sitting there like, oh God, oh, I don't, I don't think I can come back from that. So, yeah, yeah. Shakira piloted the Nostromo and got out in time. Got, pilot, yeah, <laughs> the last surviving member of the Nostromo, yes. Shakira. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And all we have to do is uh, sit there and look at PK and go, son. Yeah, in the first place, it is. It is. It is in the pantheon of diss tracks. It's like right up there next to Ether. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's like, That's- oh man. Yes, Ether equals Shakira. On oh, Thursday. my God. <laughs> uh, we'll be back at it again tomorrow, 9.05. Uh, our friends from Beyond Goals will be with us at 9.30 to discuss what's going on. Maybe we can get them to discuss diss tracks and everything else going on. I think it'll be Greg Garza's turn, considering that we had uh, Michael Parkhurst on last week. And we'll discuss the new year. We'll discuss uh, anything when it comes to the world of uh, mentoring through the the prism of soccer. So uh, I Nick, love that they're doing that so much. I really do. Yeah, and we're seeing videos of kids who have been impacted, and they're posting them on social media, and it's giving Beyond Goals the look that they're uh, that they've been hunting for as they've been building in 2022. We'll talk to Greg Garza about their look, what they're looking for in 2023. So Nick, as always, since it is the end of the show, send us home. Uh, I, I would be remiss if I didn't say happy anniversary, John. Thank you, sir. It is happy. 10, 10. I am Ty Dillinger in this case. You... 10, 10, 10. A 10. Mm-hmm. 10. So, yes. That, it, it, for those who have never met, uh, who have never met the uh, John's lovely other, other, other half, boss. Uh, the, the, the boss, they are d- uh, just spectacular together. Very <laughs> rarely do you see, uh, Couples that that are so legitimately and happily in love uh, it, that it, it brings to mind, um, you know, the conversation that Peter Bogdanovich had um, and Cary Grant called him up and said, Peter, you have to stop telling everyone you're so happy and stop telling everyone you're in love. And he's like, but God, geez, Cary, why? I thought everybody uh, 
you know, love to hear that goes, oh, don't you believe it? Because they're not happy and they're not in love. And so the whole thing is when you meet somebody who's completely happy and completely in love, it, it is just a wonderful thing to see. And John, I, you and the boss both are just uh, uh, inspirational to, to couples out there that love does exist. And it's so wonderful to see with you guys. And I could not be more thrilled and delighted to celebrate your anniversary with you guys. And I hope that everyone else out there has a great and wonderful day. Uh, do not do anything that requires you to be ethered um, <laughs> by your Shakira. John, I know that's not happening to you. That does not remotely. However, to the rest of us goons, um, don't do anything that would result in your uh, significant other putting up the, a, a Pantheon-esque diss track. And with that, I say mucha mucha euro, y'all. Play it safe, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow at 9.05. It's the end of the show. That means I get to do this. We'll see you in the morning.